So our gospel reading this morning comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1, beginning at verse 26. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be since I am a virgin? And the angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be holy, and he will be called the Son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month for her who was said to be barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And then Mary said, Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. And then the angel departed from her. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So the question put to us today is, what are you afraid of? What, what brings fear? So I will share with you that for as long as I can remember, I have always positioned myself in bed or my sleeping bag or in a bunk at camp or even on the sofa when taking a nap and in every single hotel room I've ever stayed in in my entire life. So that when I do go to sleep, my hands do not hang off or out of the bed. Why? Well, when I was three or four years old, I had this fear, and this is very specific here. I had this fear that a German shepherd would eat my fingers. Now, when I shared that fear with my youngest son, he said, Mom, we don't have a German shepherd. I said, I know. There's never been a German shepherd in my house, even as a child. That didn't matter. I had convinced myself that body parts do not dangle off the side of the bed so that they can be eaten. Our question of the day this morning was, what are you afraid of? And many of you have already boldly typed your responses to appear in our word cloud. And to your responses, I would add more of my own flying in small planes, heights to some degree, and walking into a room full of people and not knowing a soul. I have learned that the only way that I can function in those situations is just kind of stop and breathe, catch my breath, focus, recenter, and remember that I have nothing to fear. Because God meets us in our fear and offers us the hope and the assurance and peace we seek. We have come to learn about God from the generations that sit with us here in these pews and perhaps sit at table with us in our homes. We also learn about God's presence with us in all of life, but especially in the midst of our fears from generation to generation in the stories of our faith. Last Sunday, we heard of those generations of faith in the Gospel of Matthew's genealogy in chapter 1, and we learned exactly who Jesus was from home to the lineage of Joseph. This morning, we will hear about Jesus' mother, Mary, and how she dealt with her fears and how we many, many generations after her, still learn how to deal with our fears from this matriarch of our faith. 
Now, what we learn about Mary from our canon of scriptures is very little. And for those of you who wish to know more about Mary, there's an entire genre of study dedicated to her called Maryology. Um, so this morning, we are going to dig around a bit in what is not in our canon of scriptures. And when I talk about that, I mean in um, the Bible that we have right there in the pew, right? Stuff that is not right there in the Bible. But we're going to learn know a little bit more about her. And know that the information is that I will be sharing is edited a bit for content because of our younger generations um, among, among us in worship this morning. And that the information that I'm sharing with you comes from the research of Amy Jill Levine, who is a New Testament and Jewish studies professor at Vanderbilt. Um, it's from her book, Light of the World, A Beginner's Guide to Advent. Now, in our canon of scriptures in our Bible, uh, while we know all about Joseph's lineage, we know nothing about Mary's. Later writers filled in her background, and it is from a, a writing called the Protevangelum of James um, that we learn that Mary's parents are named Joachim and Anna. Um, they are a righteous, elderly, and infertile couple, much like Abraham and Sarah in the book of Genesis, um, in the Hebrew scriptures, and Zechariah and Elizabeth, who is referenced in our reading there in the Gospel of Luke. So it is a miracle that Anna gets pregnant. They have a daughter, and they, dedicated, they dedicate her to God no differently than Hannah did with her son Samuel, in the first book of Samuel, again, in the Hebrew Scriptures. Mary was raised in the temple from ages 3 to 12 until she uh, reached the ways of women. And at that point in time, Mary needed a protector to watch over her. The temple priest arranged uh, for righteous widowers to come to the temple so that they can select a protector for her. And legend has it that when Joseph's walking stick begins to flower, the priest realized he is divinely chosen to care for Mary. And Joseph is elderly and already has grown children, which help explain many other things also edited for content. Now, it's all interesting information, but information not contained in our canon of scriptures in the Bible. So we tend to um, uh, give more weight to and rely on the scriptures and then look at that common history that, that, that threads throughout um, time there, the common history of the times. And from that history, we can determine that Mary was probably in her late teens and that Joseph was probably no more than 10 years older than her. Mary was from Nazareth, which was a small town of just a few hundred people, no bigger than my hometown of Burton, population 300, not counting the cats, right? Um, where we do have lots of stop signs, but only one four-way stop. Now, take every assumption and stereotype that just popped through your head about my hometown, and that would be the exact same thing that people of that day and time thought about Nazareth. Amy Jill Levine also had this to say as we move from that presumed history and into our canonized scripture there in the Bible. She writes, something momentous and life-changing is about to occur to a Jewish woman on the outskirts of the Roman Empire. So into the scripture. From the Gospel of Luke we read, that the angel Gabriel was sent by God to Mary. Now, visits by angels are usually kind of a double-edged kind of situation. On one hand, there is the assurance of God's presence or divine protection. And on the other hand, it also means something life-changing is about to happen. Gabriel says, Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. And then, don't be afraid. And then he has a lot to say. Okay. So tucked in between Gabriel's words is Mary's reaction. She was perplexed and perhaps ran that gamut of 
um, disturbed, agitated, maybe deeply troubled. Um, maybe she had lots of questions. But she pondered the words of the greeting and perhaps braced herself for what else the angel would have to say to her. Now, let's be honest. The angel Gabriel said a lot. Gabriel said that she would conceive, bear a son, and name him Jesus. Gabriel told Mary um, who Jesus would be and come to be known as. And all that Mary learned um, was just an overwhelming amount of information. Mary's response is a little peek behind the curtain of how she handles any fear she might have had. So she kind of hits a pause button there, and she asks a question of clarification. How can this be? And Gabriel responds to her question. And for years we have heard it, and for centuries and centuries it has been argued about as to the how, and it has been treated only as a gynecological report. But Gabriel's response contains more than that. Mary is trying to wrap her head and her heart around this impossible thing that she has been told. So the angel Gabriel reminds Mary about what other impossible thing God has already done. Her cousin, Elizabeth, who struggled with fertility issues and was now beyond childbearing years, is pregnant six months along. Now remember, Mary is Jewish, and so she grew up hearing the stories of other women who also experienced God doing impossible things in their lives. Sarah was the wife of Abraham, and she had Isaac. Rebecca, the wife of Jacob, had Joseph and Benjamin. Hannah, the wife of Elkanah, had Samuel. And now she, Mary, is learning that God is, will be doing an impossible thing in her life. Gabriel even says, for nothing will be impossible with God. And it is those words and remembering how God worked in the lives of all those other women, that offer Mary the assurance that she needs to deal with any fears she might have about what is going to happen to her and how her life will change. And then she finds her words, her words. Here am I, the servant of the Lord, let it be with me. Now, the most remarkable note about Mary's story is not the revelation, but instead Mary's yes to the call. Mary's yes in spite of all of her fears. Mary's yes because she remembered the stories of others and how God led them through. Mary's yes, because she anchored her faith in a message brought to her that told her, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid, fear not. Now, that phrase occurs in our scriptures 365 times. And for many of us, we find great comfort in them, like when we hear from Isaiah 41.10, do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be afraid, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will, will uphold you with my victorious hand. Or the 23rd Psalm, also a popular one that we might know. Even though I walk through the valley, uh, the darkest valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Now, some of us find comfort in those scriptures. For others of us, we need more. Because our lives have taught us more about pain and agony and suffering and fear than we care to admit. Know this. Courage rises in spite of our fear. And know this as well. There are people in our lives who will sit with us and walk with us in our agony. 
we do not have to do life alone. Dr. Christine Hong reminds us in this quote. She writes, God moves through the liminal, tender spaces of God's human life with Mary, even as they were both afraid. And God continues to move through the liminal and tender spaces of our lives, meeting us in our fear. On this second Sunday of Advent, we lit the candle of peace. And as our liturgy put it, because we so desperately need God's peace in the midst of all that we fear. Indeed, may we find that peace in the story of Mary and her journey from fear to yes. May we find that peace in our own stories as we remember other journeys in which we have moved from fear to courage to finding God's peace in our lives. And may we remember that God continues to meet us in our fear, blessing us with the courage that we need so that we can move forward in life and in faith. Amen.